Good evening, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Meredith Lynn, a faculty member here at Bard Graduate Center, uh, and I'm pleased to welcome you tonight to the first, um, to our inaugural, inaugural talk in a new series called Archaeological Encounters. This series welcomes two archaeologists ar archaeologists each year to present their research and to engage in conversation about the study of the past and, um, and also contemporary societies through material remains. And more information about this series and our spring speaker, uh, who will be David Fontaine on February 5th, will be posted soon on our website. So I direct you to that, and I encourage you to come to that talk as well. Um, tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing to you our speaker, um, Dr. Zoe Crossland. Um, Zoe is a, the director of the Columbia Center for Archaeology uh, and a professor in the Department of Anthropology at Columbia University, where she's taught since 2006. Um, she holds a PhD in anthropology from the Univers University of Michigan. And before joining the faculty at Columbia, Zoe also held teaching and research positions at the universities of Cambridge, Leicester, and Wales Lampeter in the UK. Um, Zoe has worked on a number of exci exciting topics in archaeology, including not only the deceased body and forensics, the topics that she'll be speaking about tonight, um, but also funerary and burial practices, landscapes, time, and colonial encounters, especially in uh, the context of religious missions in Madagascar, where she has worked for more than 20 years. Um, for her fieldwork in Madagascar and other projects, she's been the recipient of numerous grants and awards uh, from such organizations as Wenner Gren, National Geographic, and the National Science Foundation. Um, and she has an extensive list of publications which I can only scratch the surface of here unless you want to listen to me talk instead of Zoe, which I'm sure you don't, <laughs> um, including Encounters with Ancestors in Highland and Madagascar, Material Signs and Traces of the Dead, a monograph published in 2014, uh, A Fine and Private Place, The Archaeology of Death and Burial in Postmedieval Britain and, I and Ireland, co-authored with Anya Cherison and Sarah Tarlow and published in 2012, and Disturbing Bodies, Perspectives on Forensic Archaeology, co-edited with Rosemary Joyce and published in 2015. And I know that several students here are familiar with Zoe's 2010 article titled Materiality and Embodiment in the well-consulted and uh, well-earmarked um, Oxford Handbook of Material Culture Studies. Um, and this mention of students reminds me to tell you that Zoe is also a dedicated teacher um, who encourages students to critically approach archaeological evidence and theory, and who has created a number of new opportunities for archaeology students at Columbia uh, to learn important skills, including GIS and archaeological illustration. Um, and I can say from personal experience that Zoe is also an, an, ex an extremely kind and generous uh, to her junior colleagues. Um, <laughs> So tonight, Zoe will speak with us about some of her research related to her most uh, recent book in preparation titled uh, Appropriate, Appropriately for Halloween, although this is totally coincidentally, <laughs> um, The Speaking Corpse, um, Forensic Evidence and Popular Empiricism. Um, and she's also just told me that um, part of this talk will be published as an article in Science and Society as well, so I'll refer you to that. Um, um, and so tonight she'll discuss how forensic investigation of dead bodies shares archaeology's concern with reconstructing past events from physical clues and traces. And she'll focus on how a close examination of evidence that for forensic investigators mobilize, as well as how they mobilize it, um, can help us to rethink what we take to be the nature of facts and the nature of corpses. Um, so um, please welcome Zoe Crossland. Meredith for a really very lovely introduction. Um, I feel like I've got a lot to live up to now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I hadn't realised until today the coincidence <laughs> of the fact that I'm talking about dead bodies um, as we come up to Halloween, but it's probably because I spend a lot of time talking about dead bodies. <laughs> so yeah, Halloween's a year-round phenomenon. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the forms of life um, that exist in and around the forensic dead body uh, in order to think critically about evidence and claims to the real. 
Um, probably the most obvious site where this is articulated is in popular forensic science, which commonly draws on the image of the speaking corpse. Um, and these are just great classic examples and many others. Um, this image of the speaking corpse conjures the figure of the witness who accuses from beyond the grave. And this is a well-worn figure of empiricism, one that situates the dead body as a fact that speaks for itself. So this post-mortem speech is generally understood you know, by forensic anthropologists and others as a rhetorical device that functions to assert both the reliability and the truthfulness of forensic facts. And yet I'd suggest that it also recognises something else, something that is otherwise unrecognisable. And that's a kind of animacy, not only for the dead, but also for fact and for evidence. And so I want to think today quite carefully about where this animacy is located and why this submerged acknowledgement of post-mortem forms of life persists in the discourse around the, the forensic corpse. And this, I think, not only opens up possibilities for conceptualizing post-mortem life, but it also disturbs a vision of forensic science as a kind of uncomplicated humanist endeavor in which a firm boundary is inscribed between death and life and between fact and interpretation. So to explore these questions, I'm going to look at a couple of different case studies. On the one hand, the, the different uses and abuses of pattern recognition in forensics, and then also the world of forensic entomology. And I can promise you I'm not going to show any gruesome <laughs> pictures, just, just to reassure you in advance. Um, before I turn to these examples, though, I'd like to just spend a little bit more time with this image of the speaking corpse. Um, most forensic writing, and I should emphasize this, the vast majority of forensic writing deals with very dry questions of method, of correct protocol, these sorts of themes. But there's this parallel literature, sort of parallel flourishing popular literature, much of it written actually by practitioners themselves. And these are just anthropologists that write forensic, forensic anthropologists that write texts. But of course, you know, you can go into the medical examiner literature and forensic entomologists, you'll find popular accounts written by all of them. This shows just a few. Uh, in anthropology alone, there are many, many memoirs and also a surprising amount of fiction. I'll just put one nod to all of the fiction there by Ka uh, one, art one book by Kathy Rice. And in these literary spaces, forensic specialists sort of allow themselves more leeway. Um, and it's here that we most often see this sort of image, this figure of the speaking corpse. Um, so for example, in Death's Acre, this one here, which is a memoir by forensic anthropologist Bill Bass, co-authored with uh, journalist John Jefferson. Bass explains that the human skeleton makes a record of past events and processes and has an ability to, quote, reveal them to anyone with eyes trained to see the rich visual record, to hear the faint whispers rising from the dead. I feel like I should put that in a really sort of sepulch sepulchral voice, you know, <laughs> for, for Halloween. Anyway, this, this image fuses the, the expertise uh, involved in deciphering the skeleton's rich visual record to a kind of supernatural ability to hear the whispers of the dead. And it also expresses a tension between the training that's needed to decipher this evidence of the dead body and then the apparent unforced insistence of the corpse, which seems to sort of quietly assert its evidence regardless of who's there to hear it. And we see this again um, in the work of the eminent forensic anthropologist Clyde Snow, who famously, famously described bones as witnesses, saying, although they speak softly, they never lie and they never forget. Um, and Thomas Keenan and Ayl Weissman have written a short book, which came out in 2012, called Mengele's Skull, about the case that's illustrated on the cover of this book. Uh, and in it, they suggest that despite this blurring between life and death, Clyde Snow was always a good scientist who knew the difference between subjects and objects. His use of the image of the corpse as witness they, was, they remark, a way of identifying the truth as self-evident, and this is quoting them here, lingering, fossilized in the object. So, of course, the image of the speaking corpse participates in this broader empiricist imaginary of self-evidence. 
It's not just dead bodies that speak, but facts in general that speak for themselves. And I want to think about the way here, this notion of truth being somehow lodged in the object. To think critically about it. Um, Bruno Latour has written on this in his 2004 book, Politics of Nature. And I discuss this more in the article that's coming out. Um, and he, he describes the idea that facts speak for themselves as, as what he calls a naive epistemological myth. Um, in this way, the representatives of facts, in this case forensic scientists, and this is quoting Latour, they make the mute world, world speak. They tell the truth without being challenged put an end to the interminable arguments through an incontestable form of authority that would stem from things themselves. So what we have here are scientists that are being positioned as ventriloquizing fact. Um, and I think, you know, in many ways, um, despite Latour's, you know, very careful tracking of the way that scientific claims are made, this, this kind of caricature, caricature ignores the complexity of the figure of facts that speak. Uh, there's actually much more going on there, I think. Um, and there's a, a key complication to the speaking corpse is lodged in this figure of the witness. The evidence of the dead is often described as a kind of testimony, as we can see here. And yet, this is interesting because this would seem to be fraught with pitfalls. You know, witnesses are notoriously unreliable. They offer testimony that suffers from the frailties of memory, the deceits of those with something to hide. And in an imaginary where facts must be maintained sort of separate from the values of those that interpret them, there seems to be some kind of risk here, right, in allowing the sort of subjectivity of the human witness to enter into this naturalized world of objective fact. Reaching for the metaphor of the corpse as witness seems then to be a hazardous move. So one of the things I want to ask about what is what does it offer to offset this risk. And obviously we can start by observing that the image of the testifying witness resonates in the context of legal inquiry. And Keenan and Weissman note that it also recognizes the human, that human remains never resolve, as they say, entirely into objects, but also retain some trace of the subject. And again, this is sort of, again, sort of thinking um, implicitly about this sort of separation of fact and value of object and subject. What I'd suggest is that the corpse as witness offers something more. And, and this is a recognition that testimony is given towards an end. That the speaking facts of the corpse are in a relationship with those that collect and disseminate them. And that the corpse's speech must be heard in order to have any efficacy. So witnesses always act as witnesses of something to someone or to an institution. And it's in this recognition that the ongoing life of forensic facts may be located. Life persists in the ways in which facts are picked up by others and acted upon. So what I want to emphasize here then is this dual aspect of the speaking corpse. On the one hand, in asserting that facts speak independently of any work that goes on around them, it effaces and narrows down the agency of the investigator. And in this case, all of the problems and errors that may be introduced into forensic evidence are understood to come from problems of subjectivity and the lack of proper expertise on the part of the forensic analyst, whose role is really only to communicate the facts without intervening. So that's one view. And yet on the other, we have this other sort of dual image that acknowledges that testifying speech expects a recipient and that the corpse can only have life through others. And I think this is a richer kind of speech than Latour recognises in his discussion of how it's channeled through those spokespersons who represent the dead. Certainly the self-evident fact, of uh, self-evident speech of fact is one dimension to the speaking corpse, but also present is this submerged acknowledgement that the speech of the corpse can land in a range of ways. It can variously affect those who experience it. And importantly, it is itself speech that interprets prior events. So on the surface, the image of the speaking fact, the speaking corpse, emphasizes fact as logos the mythical originating speech of presence that Derrida so thoroughly critiqued in Of Grammatology. 
But also present is this other way of imagining fact as testimony, as a sign, a sign to someone or something of another displaced referent. And it's this semiotic dimension that I want to explore today using theory drawn from the American pragmatist philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce. So the speech of the witness acts as a semiotic point of articulation between events experienced by the witness and the judge and jury's understanding of those events. So even forensic facts that appear self-evident must rely on someone recognising the signs through which their self-evidence is made manifest. So, okay, so if we go along with Derrida then, um, in the recognition that the forensic fact is not absolute... Where does that leave us with claims that are articulated around such facts? It's clear that forensic facts may seem to speak for themselves, yet they don't constitute a sort of originary moment of presence that puts an end to the chain of signification. They can be and they are contested. But at the same time, forensic facts have a degree of stability and some faith may be placed in them. And indeed, we have to place faith in them uh, if we're not to erode the foundations upon which the apparatus of law rests. So I'm going to turn now to my two case studies of pattern recognition and entomology. And I want to explore how fact speaks by considering the nature of the propositions made by the dead. And some of you who are familiar with Latour may sort of hear resonances with Latour's discussion of propositions here. I'm not going to go into that, but I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. I want to think about what kind of speech is recognisable within the for forums of forensic practice and how it's articulated. Where does its stability lie and under what terms may it be questioned? In any forensic investigation, the question of evidence is central. And it turns out that it's also central to the varied afterlives of the dead. In tracking how the evidence of the corpse is deployed as a series of sign relations, we can see how new forms of life emerge and persist. And it's here that we can find ways to think productively about the post-mortem agency and life of the dead, as well as the life of evidence. So, to start with pattern recognition, fundamental for the claims made through forensic evidence is the capacity of material traces not only to disrupt the stories that are told about the past, but also to engender new narratives. So the events of the past are revealed not because the murderer confesses, but because an assemblage of material signs is interpreted to reconstruct what took place. In this way, evidence can intervene into language and discourse and reorient it towards a different narrative. So the forensic trace constrains what can be said of it, and yet in order for the, the trace to speak, it must be interpreted by a forensic scientist and expert witness. And the complexities of this can be seen in recent debates over pattern identification. And this is a practice that's shared by a number of forensic fields different forensic fields and has really come under uh, critical scrutiny recently. So, for example, just to give you a couple of examples, kerf marks, um, the example of saw marks on bones find at a crime, found at a crime scene can encompass an, an effort to match what they call witness marks with a particular type of saw blade. Another example of pattern recognition is coming back again to Mengele skull. Um, is that of craniofacial superposition, where a comparison is made between the shape and the features of an unidentified skull and features recorded in photographs of missing persons. So the originating models for this kind of work of pattern recognition uh, lie in the practices of the 19th century with the development of anthropometric techniques of identification, especially the emergence of fingerprinting. And fiction bridge impressions, so that's palm prints, soul prints, and fingerprints, are one of the most well-established and long-standing forms of pattern recognition in forensic evidence practices. And fingerprints take us on a slight detour from the, from the speaking corpse, but I want to stay with them for a moment because they're very interesting uh, sort of epistemic artifacts to think with in terms of what they reveal about how forensic evidence operates. Thank you. 
an interest in using fingerprints to, uh, to, to track identity first emerged in the context of colonial governance in the second half of the 19th century, particular, particularly in India, and actually well before fingerprints were used by police. Fingerprints were then sort of the, sort of picked up on by police and by the early 20th century became a formalized part of police work transnationally. So there's a very long history of their use. And because of this, they've come to be widely understood as providing solid proof of identity and a sort of stable basis for forensic claims. So Jennifer Manukin, who's written on this, notes that they've long held, they've long been held to constitute, quote, the very archetype of reliable expert testimony. Understood to have an error rate that is essentially zero when properly applied. <coughs> and yet, despite this great trust in fingerprints, their reliability as courtroom testimony has been questioned with greater frequency over the last couple of decades, two to three decades. It turns out they're not as straightforward as they've been presented by forensic experts. So there are multiple sources to the difficulties with fingerprints. We can start with just their collection and identification of the crime scene. You know, when we're thinking about fingerprints, we think about these 10 prints that are taken in the context of the police station. But in the crime scene, they're often distorted. They're often, they're usually partial. Maybe just, maybe just the edge, you know, a fingertip or the edge of the palm. The orientation of the, of the print can be difficult to discern. And there can be little clarity on which finger or thumb made the impression. So already there's, you know, it's, it's, there's, there are these difficulties introduced. And then we have to take into account that the fact that most prints are latent prints, um, not usually made in something clear like sort of blood or paint, but rather just made out of the sort of sweats and oils on the body. And so they're usually invisible to, to casual in examination and traditionally have been picked up by dusting with powder and then lifted using adhesive tape. And of course, when you do that, when you lift them off with adhesive tape, you also lift off characteristics of the surface to which they adhere. So you're, you, you're, you're bringing other sort of information in alongside the print, um, making it difficult sometimes to distinguish the trace of the fingerprint from the noise within which it sits. Having said this, these interpretive problems haven't prevented fingerprint experts from asserting that they can make a definitive match. But a landmark report that was uh, published on forensic science in the US in 2009, commissioned by the National Academies of Science, noted that the, the Friction Ridge community actively discourages its members from testifying in terms of the probability of a match. So they don't like to say, you know, we think it's with an 80% probability this is a match. It's either a match or it isn't a match. Uh, when they claim they've made a match, they're communicating the notion this is from this report again, that the prints could not possibly have come from two different individuals. So it's, uh, it, uh, and this notion of individualization is really sort of, has been very important uh, to forensic science. And again, it's increasingly being viewed as problematic. So in this kind of tradition of expertise, fingerprints are understood to speak assertively and unambiguously. Outside the realm of fingerprints, other forms of <coughs> recognition have been viewed with more circumspection. So, for example, uh, the acceptance of craniofacial super superposition as a mode of identification is quite contested within the field of forensic anthropology. <coughs> Many would argue that it should not be used to make a positive identification and only rarely deployed to exclude possible matches. So there's really a lot of uh, debate over using them. And yet, despite these concerns in the literature, it continues to be used um, and is admissible as evidence in many domains. <coughs> so if we turn to um, Charles Sanders Peirce at this moment, and we can think about his well-known distinction between icon, index, and symbol, then we can think about how pattern recognition operates most obviously along the axis of the iconic sign. So that's to say the skull looks like the photograph. The print looks like the friction ridges that made it. It's this similarity that most immediately conjures their evidentiary power. And Douglas Uberlaker, who's a forensic anthropologist, has remarked that craniofacial superposition makes a forceful statement simply 
by virtue of its visual drama. The display of such comparisons provides maximum impact in a courtroom setting, and we can really see that here. This is actually from um, Keenan and Weissman's book, where they illustrate this through this really arresting sequence of, of images showing photographs of, of Josef Mengele superimposed on a skull that was presumed to be his. So there's a kind of visual argument that's being made here, presented by these overlaid images. Just as with fingerprints, the similarity can be seen by all with apparently little interpretation needed to determine that one image resembles the other. But this, of course, is the end point in a, in a chain of observation and, and inference that, it, that is fraught with difficulties. Coming back to this, what, what has been thought of as the gold standard of fingerprints, uh, there have been instances of false positive identification since the 1920s, uh, but these have normally been ascribed to poor training or incompetence on the part of the examiner. This is something that Simon Cole has um, written about in his book, Suspect Identities. But recent high profile cases have led to a really quite critical re-examination of, of the reliability of fingerprints and for calls for rigorous proficiency tests to be developed alongside techniques to evaluate the factors that may influence misidentifications. <clears throat> so this is drawn from the case of Oregon attorney Brandon Mayfield, who was charged by the FBI with being a material witness to the Madrid terrorist bombing of March 2004. And a number of respected US fingerprint examiners confirmed that a latent print found at the crime scene in Madrid was his, even though he said he was in, uh, in the US at the time. But this, and this identification was subsequently shown to be wrong, to be an error. And the case pointed to some of the ambiguities and inadequacies of fingerprint evidence, not least that a relationship of similarity is much more complex than it may at first seem. So first, the question arises of how much variation from the original is permissible for a fingerprint to be identified as a match. A relationship of similarity must always be constituted on the basis of some difference from the original. So the trace of a fingerprint can never be identical to the finger. It may be in ink or in blood, it may be flattened, it may incorporate other features of the surface that it's stuck to, it may disguise or exclude elements that can be observed as present on the ridges of the finger. So given all of these difficulties, how do we evaluate similarity? How is an evaluation made? And what, what also might affect how a judgment is made on that similarity? <clears throat> and actually, one of the things that Simon Cole has written about is quite interesting, is the ways in which there are different national traditions in, for example, the US and in the UK for establishing a match. And they have different ways of deciding what is or what is not a match um, using different criteria. But in the Mayfield case, there's also additional outside information, what we might call collateral information, that was not about the relationship of print to, um, to, to finger, but actually something else that influenced the reading. And it seems to have contributed to identifying Mayfield as a, sub as a suspect. It turns out that he was a Muslim convert with an Egyptian wife, and he'd represented in a child custody case one of the Portland Seven, which was a group of Muslim men convicted of, of terrorist conspiracy. So clearly this had an effect on the way that his prints were read and then the conviction of uh, particular experts that they were, were seeing a match when, when there was, this was not the case. So following this case and the highly critical report of National Academies of Science, Forensic researchers have initiated studies to assess the rigour of fingerprint analysis and other forensic practices. And it's become clear that the assessment of fingerprint matches is not a straightforward task, and it can be influenced by a whole range of contextual factors. And the, the Mayfield case really illustrates the variability in A, what is recognisable as the same, but also reveals the potential fragility of judgments made on such evidence. So there are degrees of similarity and no certainty of exactitude. <clears throat> so we can see that the forceful <coughs> argument is made through the similarity between two patterns, whether it's the skull and the photograph or the finger and the fingerprint. 
But what endows forensic evidence with the power to convince and to convict is the indexical relationship of a sign with its object. An iconic sign of likeness tells us something about its referent, but it can't tell us that the referent really exists. So that's to say that this print tells us a lot about what the ridges on the finger look like, but it only describes the finger that, um, that made the print. It doesn't establish a relationship to a particular finger. For that, we need to assert an indexical sign. So we're saying that this print doesn't simply resemble a finger, but rather that this print was made by this finger, that there's an actual existing relationship between the finger and the print. And for forensic science, the key issue is over how to, how to demonstrate indexicality. How do you show that marks don't resemble each other through chance, through fraud, or through wishful thinking, but rather that crime scene prints are in an actual existing relationship to the supposed perpetrator? And yet, here is where it gets incredibly sticky and difficult to establish Indexicality, you have to rely upon iconicity. So we've got this really kind of complex um, conjunction of these two um, forms of sign. So reflecting on the powerful nature of signs in which indexes are tied to icons, Peirce noted that when an index forces something to be recognized as an icon, the two elements together make an assertion and form a proposition. And to show how such propositions work, Peirce provided the example of a portrait with a legend under it. So the portrait itself, the image, the painting, describes the characteristics of the individual portrayed. But it makes no claim as to whether that person ever really existed, right? It could be a completely imaginary person that's represented in the portrait. It's the label, it's the label that donate, donate, denotes and gives the name of the person which makes a claim to an existing connection between the portrait and the person who sat for it. So there's an exa this is an example where the two elements are kind of quite clear and distinct, but usually in propositional signs like this, neither element is prescinded from the other, but they kind of fuse together to form, to foster an immediately experienced perceptual judgment, right, where you just sort of see it and make an assumption about its connection. So pattern matching makes a similar assertion of identity through the same com powerful combination of marks of index and icon. In the, face of, in the case of craniofacial superposition, it's the indexical link between photographic face and skull, the one denoting the other, that gives this forensic sign its evidential authority. <clears throat> But to make an identification using this method, a relationship of similarity must be relied upon. So what seems to be a, a simple matter turns out to be really quite a complex twofold problem of indexicality built on iconicity. And further complicating this proposition, formed jointly by icon and index, is the way in which it seems to present a kind of argument that can be quickly intuited without the intervention of language. So when we see composite images of Mengele's face and skull as presented by forensic specialists um, to the world's press, uh, at the time that the, the reaction was immediate, the press were convinced completely by these, by these images that the superpositioning of face over skull made a very forceful argument, um, even if it had the potential to be wrong. So popular judgment recognized a perfect match this was considered premature by many forensic specialists. And in fact, the question of identification wasn't settled until a sample was later sent for DNA analysis. So the iconic index is very important to forensic evidence, and it has a kind of immediacy. When forensic evidence is treated as fact that speaks for itself, what it's doing is kind of privileging this iconic index. It's making a cut between that proposition and then the response to it. It ignores the sort of interpreting element, the element that, that of judgment that's formed around the proposition that's offered. And a lot of this is because the sort of first perceptual judgment that we make in response to such facts is, is so immediate and so and often pre-discursive. So it seems to come from the evidential object itself, <clears throat> it seems to be sort of thrust upon us. And framed in the context of the courtroom, 
such evidence mobilizes a kind of agency, not simply in the way that it prompts this immediate response, but also, and this is where I want to come back to this question of the life of evidence, uh, because it's part of a broader world of sense making that itself shifts and grows. And it's this aspect that the idea of facts as testimony or witness comes to the fore. So a fingerprint is already is always uh, a, is already a trace of an earlier moment. It's a it's itself a part of life's continuum, and of course it has to be recognised and interpreted in order to be acknowledged and converted into further sort of iconic indexical diagrams, further propositions, which are then presented to a jury. And the jury, in turn, seizes upon these traces of traces to make further judgments and actions based upon them. And this chain continues until it's brought to a halt by a judgment, a judgment of guilty or innocent. And this halt may only be provisional. Outside the courtroom, the same evidence can continue to, to live, perhaps being redeployed as part of an appeal or reanalyzed to better understand the claims made around it. Uh, just as testifying speech is directed to an end, so semiotic propositions, when taken as evidence, are interpreted as part of a broader enchainment of signs. And in this way, fingerprints and human bones continue to have effects, effects which grow and spread into new and yet related forms of evidential life. It's in this sense there's a continuing animacy to such traces as they continue to circulate in changing formations. And I want to take the semiotic life seriously, not treating it as a metaphor, but as something that exists in the world. In tracing the life of evidence, we can see how it's not something that's held by the corpse alone, lodged in the body of the corpse, but instead grows and develops. Um, it takes on habits, it incorporates many elements of the world, and in taking on these particular sort of habits, um, these can also change, they can shift and be contested. In doing this, it pays little attention to the imagined boundaries of nature and culture or object and subject. So I think paying attention to the life of forensic evidence allows us to think, allows us to sort of think around the dualism of the fact-value distinction. It allows us to put the, the conventions of object and subject under scrutiny. And I'd like to explore this more in the, the next section where I think through another dimension of evidential life, which is in the work of forensic entomology. <clears throat> so forensic entomology is interesting because it reveals how forensic work also stretches into the world of insect and animal semiosis. It's a broad and growing field in which specialists are brought in to study insects when they pertain to a whole range of legal cases. But the most high profile area of research is uh, centered on medical, medical criminal forensic entomology, so particularly death investigations. By identifying and describing species that converge on the corpse after death, forensic entomologists work to understand the depositional con conditions and to estimate the time since death. The changing profile of the insect community around the corpse then offers a kind of index of the time that's passed. And to understand the constitution of the community of insects that arrive after death, entomologists must identify and recognize the different life stages of the, of the different animals and insects that are present at the corpse, as well as the order of successive arrivals. So Blowfly, which I've got up here, provide a good example of, how, of the sort of interaction of the forensic experts and insects. Forensic entomological work shows that blowfides tend to arrive very early at the body. The females seem to be attracted to the corpse as a, as a site to lay eggs. And these and other early arriving insects, such as flesh flies and house flies, are then followed by their predators, including wasps and ants. And then over time, more wasps and ant species arrive, along with omnivorous beetles, attracted both to the corpse and also the in to the insects as a food source. And then finally, in an outdoor environment, as, decom uh, uh, as decomposition slows, the corpse becomes more integrated into the local ecology and you get sort of centipedes and spiders and wood lice wandering over and onto it and perhaps using it as a site of shelter. As blowfly eggs develop into maggot larvae, they pass through two molts, 
shedding their exoskeleton and leaving characteristic traces of the stages they've passed through. So then they develop into pupae and finally into adult flies. And to understand how the life stages and succession of insects acts as an indexical sign of post-mortem interval requires a kind of bracketing off of the world of human meaning making and a kind of foray into the uh, semiotic worlds of insects and other non-human animals. And here I'm sort of um, referencing the work of y Jakob von Uxkel from the early 20th century, who, like Peirce, developed the insight that significance or meaning isn't the exclusive provenance of humans. Um, von Uxkel argued that we all live in our own worlds or Umwelten that are attuned to different sensory cues, but our worlds intersect with others with those of others to different degrees, insofar as we recognize the same or similar signs. And the, the work of forensic entomologists really articulates this same insight, working with insect signs as the common ground around which partial understanding of the insect umwelt can be constructed. <clears throat> so this means not only thinking about the corpse as an appealing source of food, and a site for insect reproduction, but also suppressing the more usually expected human responses of horror and disgust at decomposition. As gases are released and putrefaction sets in, the corpse becomes, for humans, usually a site of revulsion and shock, um, particularly, obviously, for those who are familiar with the deceased. In perceiving these irreversible changes, we realise with the dismay that the life that we recognised has ended and that the corpse is becoming part of life worlds which now ignore the boundaries of the body and the scale of the living human. So here we can see how forensic entomology constitutes a site of meaning making in and through the very abjected processes that are usually viewed by theorists as on the constitutive outside of human life. Entering into the world of insect semiosis, forensic entomologists embrace the abject and they temporarily place themselves in the position of the insect, such as the blowfly. So they have to think like an insect. They have to think how for a mature female blowfly seeking to lay eggs, the, the, the dead body offers an attractive prospect. They have to think about how the odours of ammonia and sulphide compound are signs for the fly that this is a desirable site. <clears throat> and entomologists call these volatile organic compounds semiochemicals, recognising their status as signs through which insects can learn about the presence and status of a body. Key to understanding these semiotic worlds is the interplay of iconic indexical signs and how they're acted upon. <clears throat> So the insects then that smell this, these decomposition volatiles released by the corpse are also sensing a proposition, a proposition to which they respond. And that proposition is that a food source is located over there. And we can think about the smell of decomposition then as both an index of the location of the corpse in the same way that smoke is an index of fire, um, but also in some way it's like the corpse. The smell offers a description of what's there and of the status of the body. Its chemical composition reflects the state of decay. So flies therefore rely on the iconic characteristic of the, of the gases released during decomposition to detect and recognize the corpse. But it's the indexicality of the sign of gas that means they can actually locate the corpse via these iconic signs. So we can think, for example, about how the, the ambiguity of reference uh, that characterizes the iconic sign can be taken advantage of by forensic entomologists. Blowflies can be fooled. You fool them by making a synthetic odor of decomposition that doesn't index the presence of a body, but rather a bait trap. And plants, of course, also do this. You have various plants that simulate the sort of semiochemical to attract insect pollinators. So. The, 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 the smell is describing the corpse, it's, in, it's iconic of the corpse, but it indexes not the corpse, but a bait trap. And conversely, we can think sort of the opposite way around, if weather conditions or post-mortem treatment of the body radically affect the process of decomposition, then the semiochemical index cannot, may not be re recognisable as a food source. And so index, insects may fail to attend to the corpse. So 
the iconic and indexical elements together prompt this sort of interpreting response by insects to, to congregate at the body at different moments. In working towards an understanding of the signs that an insect is oriented towards, forensic entomologists also recognize how the insect itself is an embodied and interpreting sign that can be mobilized in a forensic narrative. So the entomologist is shifting here between taking an insect perspective on the corpse and then a forensic perspective on the insect. So they first sort of attempt to align their interpretation of the dead body signs with those of the insects that inhabit it, and then they sort of move outside the frame of insect semiosis to interpret the presence of insects as an iconic indexical sign of time passing. And as with the semiotics of crime scene pattern recognition, like with fingerprints, the assessment of, of insect evidence is tied indexically to the specifics of time and place, and it relies upon this intact and undisturbed chain of evidence, a semiotic chain. And of course, it also has an iconic dimension in the sense that as the record of insect succession describes, um, is, is described, it, it, at the same time, it describes the gradual disintegration of the human. <clears throat> so what we see here, interestingly, as a side note, is the way in which the forensic entomologist is finding a way to spatialize time here, to translate the sort of emergent becoming of the corpse into a map of time unfolding. And such evidence has to be very carefully situated within a careful assessment of local environmental conditions, including those of the corpse itself, in order to be sure that the iconic indexicality of index insect succession is properly understood. So this includes things like local weather patterns, temperature, and even the more localized environment of the corpse, such as whether it's wrapped um, or affected by burial. So the measurement of the post-mortem interval is therefore not a straightforward matter, and it's influenced by a whole range of different variables in a non-linear fashion. As with forensic te techniques of pattern recognition, in response to these criticisms that have been sort of mobilized within forensic science, entomologists are developing now studies to assess error rates and to express truth claims in terms of likelihood rather than certainty. And it's interesting to me this because it's a more uh, probabilistic kind of evidential regime than the one that grew up around fingerprints. So, and they're concerned with the probability that a forensic trace points correctly to its reference has, of course, been with forensic science since the early days of fingerprints. Francis Galton's uh, book on fingerprints from 1892 talks a lot about probability. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it, it seems to have shifted um, over the course of the 20th century, particularly in the context of police investigations, toward this sort of search for certainty and, and thinking again about the sort of rhetoric, uh, rhetoric of, the, of the law court and the way people try to convince. Not only, I think, is there increasing recognition today now of the lacunae the within forensic evidence, the example of forensic entomology also shows that this is work that doesn't have to posit a clear separation of natural fact and human value. Instead, it acknowledges the semiotic work of insects and the forensic specialist's ability to shift her perspective as she follows the lines of semiotic inquiry. So here we have a kind of emerging form of forensic expertise that seems more comfortable with relative uncertainty, that acknowledges that estimating the index of the time since death relies upon particular semiotic habits of insects uh, in response to particular environmental conditions. As life processes, such habits are not mechanistic or entirely predictable, but they shift and they change in ways that can be approximated, but not completely controlled for. In acknowledging the possibility of failure, space also mm -hmm. op opens up for error on the past, part of the analyst. Rather than this being understood as work that must sort of stave off subjectivity or risk polluting this privileged relationship between expert and data, questions can be asked about what might affect the work of interpretation of both insect and expert, and how collateral information may or may not enter into the analysis. So just to finish with some concluding thoughts then, recognition of propositional signs like this uh, is distributed through the world. It's a component of perception. In this sense, 
propositional signs are a fundamental part of life processes. Um, and in a recent book by Frederick Sternfeld called Natural Propositions, he suggests that this is a kind of argument that's made when a person or an insect takes a semiotic proposition as a truth sign. That's to say that insects have the, the habit of acting on some semiochemicals because a perceptual judgment is made based on this doubling of icon and index, which describes on the one hand and denotes on the other, offering the promise of, the conne of a connection to a referent. <clears throat> and it's through such signs that we encounter the real and we act upon it. It's in this way that the reality of an entity is disclosed through the, the, the different ways in which um, different beings identify and recognize its signs. And yet, although propositions may be a part of life processes distributed through the world and offering humans and other animals a seem seemingly trustworthy basis to act, the impression they offer can always be, can always be wrong. The, proposition, the propositional sign offers a kind of first approximation that allows living creatures to act with some confidence based on previous interpretive habits, but it also carries with it the possibility of error. A fingerprint can look like one from a crime scene on another continent. A bait trap can smell like a food source. What we're working with here is a probabilistic <coughs> evidentiary world in which certainty remains out of reach, but where semiotic habits can elicit some confidence in what will be found. So the question then becomes, what contextual information is relevant? and permissible within the evidential regime that specifies forensic truth claims. Returning to the speaking corpse, I think a semiotic perspective on its propositional speech opens up avenues to explore different forms of agency and animacy and to find a language to distinguish between living and inert matter without drawing a hard line between them. So fingerprints have their own form of semiotic life, but these differ in how they're embodied in signs and take on habits from insect semiosis. So this allows us to think about the grain and texture of agency itself, and to acknowledge that there are differences between the emergent semiotic agency of fingerprints, insects, and humans. And I think what, what Peirce opens up here in terms of thinking about evidence is another way, another route to think with uh, a flattened ontology, so the flattened ontology that's so um, popular at the moment. What it allows is it, it creates avenues to, to explore diverse forms of life and non-life and their variable effects in the world. So how can we conceptualize the afterlives of the forensic dead? What finally is recognized in the figure of the speaking corpse? I started uh, this evening by drawing a contrast between these two perspectives on the dead body's self-evident speech. If on the surface such speech has no expectation of an audience, hiding behind this is another figure of the witness that recognizes that evidential speech reports back from somewhere else and needs to be received to have any efficacy. In pointing us towards the real, no matter how erroneously, the iconic indexical signs of forensic practice connect us with something outside themselves. They have an immediacy that elicits a feeling for their agency, of their independent life, aside from how they are taken forward. But to privilege this dimension alone is to efface the relationships through which they're articulated and disseminated. It's in these relationships that evidence and the dead find continuing life. <clears throat> this kind of claim may seem to deny the very reality of death. Certainly from a human perspective, the capacity to self-reflexively enact change in the world shifts decisively with death. And yet the capacity to act is always dist distributed, as Bruno Latour reminds us, and is never a simple property of a person. Even within the bounds of the individual, we are composite creatures made up of a rich bacteriological microbiome. So in a person's transition from living to dead, there's a qualitative change that means more to us as humans than it does to other forms of life that dwell within and with us. The self-reflexive ability to act shifts its center of gravity away from the person who's died and into more diffuse post-mortem habits 
finding its way into bequests and directives, as well as into the humans and animals that surround the corpse. Despite the rupture of death, continuity persists. The dead are not only incorporated into a variety of other meaningful worlds, human and animal-like, but they also impact how those worlds unfold. Whether it's in the ways in which the corpse provides for new life to develop and grow, or in the way in which the dead and their insect communities are not only folded into forensic semiotic work, but actually structure its unfolding, the dead continue to act as long as they remain part of these burgeoning semiotic processes. This insight, I think, undermines a simple opposition between the object world of death and the agentive world of life. The key question is therefore less one of whether the dead have afterlives and more one of what forms of life are recognisable. Equally, in thinking about forensic evidence, the corpse may be understood as an entity whose reality is disclosed and acted upon through the signs that different beings perceive in hearing in it. It's in this embodied sensuous semiosis that the life of evidence continues. In recognising the forms of life that continue after death, we can also see how evidence stretches across the divide of people and nature, interpretation and facts, pointing to the hidden depths and complexities of maternity's forensic trace. Thank you. a question about the fingerprints uh, sure. as I'm getting older going to the hospital I check my uh, fingerprints for getting in and out and each time I get about 50 or 60 percentages but there's one lady doctor there she's in the 70s she gets zero <laughs> she doesn't have many fingerprints left so how reliable are your fingerprints for identifying uh, yeah. older people the older question. criminals too I have terrible problems coming through um, uh, you know, getting my fingerprints scanned every time I try to come through customs and immigration. Yeah, it's a, it's an issue. I mean, these the, the machines are pretty damn good at recognizing fingerprints these days. But you know, again, with those those fingerprint recognition te technology, you've got to think that they're working with, you know, a very recognizable set of prints. Um, so it's much easier for them to establish a match than it would be okay. in a crime scene context. And what about these other on the palm? Are they more reliable compared to the fingers and thumbs? I think there's fewer... What, what goes through the atrophy more? The yeah. fingers or the palm? I don't know. Or everything? I, think, I imagine the fingers would probably get damaged more easily than the palm. We use them yeah. more. But I think there's not the same database of palm and prints that there are of fingerprints. If you think about the, the way in which, you know, police force forces all over take take prints the moment somebody gets booked, right? So well, they, they don't take palm prints and footprints okay, with the you. same frequency. Yeah. Maybe just because it brought up what, what I was thinking about um, pattern recognition in the two examples you used, there's still a visual medium in between. Mm -hmm. So I guess one can always blame, you know, the, the trained judgment and, and the person looking at the images or the visual medium. Um, how has the, the discourse changed with artificial intelligence and, and machine reading? Is there a, a new kind of evaluating? Yeah, so they have this um, huge uh, data, fingerprint database. Um, and what you, what you the way that normally works is people feed date fingers into it, and then that brings up a range of prints that could be possible matches. But then the actual work of establishing the match is always done by, a, by an expert. And Simon Cole's written very interestingly about this, about the different ways in which matches are made. And in, in the UK, for example, their, their strategy was to... Um, look for point, a number of points of comparison to you. I think you had to have 16, minimum of 16 points of similarity between the print, the, you know, the two prints. Um, whereas in the US, there was more emphasis on expert judgment on, so not just points of comparison, but looking at things like features of the finger, if there's scars or particular pores or other sort of elements that could be brought in. And each, each sort of regime viewed the others with great suspicion right <laughs> and is unreliable and problematic but it, it, as it turns out you know that there's a parallel case to the the Brandon Mayfield case that in the UK where a policewoman was accused of being present at a crime scene where she hadn't been present because they found a, a fingerprint that people thought was hers so I think a lot a lot of the issue is that the fingerprint evidence just hasn't been scrutinized uh, people haven't thought carefully about what this question, you know, what it is to make a match, and the thing, and 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 they haven't, um, in the past, worked hard enough to establish things like error rates on the part of um, experts because 
that would undermine what what it what it is to be an expert, right? If you make errors, then you how can you be an expert? Whereas now people are starting to sort of open up and think, well, you know, this this is something that's going to be important. And also things like context, you know, whether or not that the fact that these fingerprint examiners knew that these fingerprints came from Brandon Mayfield and knew about his history clearly influenced yeah. how they were reading it, right? So that, that sort of stuff needs to be corralled off. They need to sort of think about the, the whole sort of regime of, of um, how comparison is made in order to try and protect <coughs> against these other, these other factors. So I have a question, uh, which is uh, kind of leads off of this one, um, which is, I guess, why do you think that people are a little bit more open to talking about margins of error um, within certain kinds, maybe not with fingerprints as much mm -hmm. as, as um, the, the entomology, but uh, you mentioned law cases and that things aren't holding up in court, court as, as potentially part of that, but are there other things that you see going on that's leading people to be a bit more, I guess, reflexive about what yeah, they're doing? I think that, that there are actually a couple of big um, law um, cases, like big cases in the past. Um, that's, I think it was in the 1990s. Uh, one was called um, Daubert, which you may have heard about if you don't. Yeah. And the other was Come Ho. Um, and they were basically about the admissibility of scientific evidence. Um, and Daubert sort of um, asserted that a judge had to sort of assess the validity before expert evidence could be admitted into um, test into court as testimony, and and then they laid out these sort of criteria through which scientific evidence would be acceptable. And they had things like general acceptability, peer review, standardization, error rates, testing. So that's part of where this is coming from, um, and and one of the big criticisms of fingerprint evidence is that n none of these things actually have been used, only the sort of general acceptance, that's been the only sort of criterion that, that, that has been in operation. Um, but I think people were just, you know, they were so much invested in the habit of doing fingerprints and of assuming that they were absolutely reliable, that it's taken these major sort of disruptions to really start to for, force people to sort of reassess. Um, two, I mean, two big, big cases, the Brandon Mayfield and this other case in Scotland, where people were really, you know, accused erroneously and it was very disruptive um yeah it's interesting but I, you know i think it's it, this is ongoing i mean i think there's still a lot of people using fingerprint evidence in the way that it's always been used so it's this this sort of the critiques that are being written about are still very much in the world of academia mm -hmm. and they're not they're, they haven't necessarily permeated through to mm -hmm. through all the courts yet can I follow up on that? Yeah. I mean, I'm interested in this, the social world of the courtroom and the kinds of debates that would have gone on by people who had an investment in undercutting the authority of a certain claim. You know, So cross-examinations are meant to, to contest authority of a particular kind of witness. In this case, it might be a fingerprint as the witness or whatnot. Um, I mean, is there a kind of analysis of the back and forth courtroom drama that would be revealing from a semiotic perspective of how context is being brought in in different ways or being mobilized. I mean, what you presented with us is a sense in which sort of culture is just accepting in a binary way the validity of a match or not in a, a fingerprint. But I would imagine in courtrooms there's much more space. Maybe they're just bad lawyers, but yeah. you know, you'd think that they would have confronting Bad, um, or, or loose, loose connections to have Yeah, I mean, that. I think usually what you see are con competing experts. So you get one who will say, you know, this is absolutely a match, and another will say, that's absolutely not a match. And then it becomes about the expert and how reliable the expert is. And, and what's really interesting is a, a lot of the work that's written, I think a lot of that, um, the memoirs and the fiction that's written by, say, forensic anthropologists and other forensic um experts is actually part of the production of expertise. It's about creating themselves as someone who's very well known and very respected and, you know, the, 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 who can be trusted and relied upon um, in, in these kind of contexts. Yeah. So it's, it really is purely about the authority of... I think that authority is, the, has been a lot. It's been a, yeah. I mean, increasingly, you know, as I say, people are now being asked to provide things like error rates where that's possible. They haven't been able to do it for fingerprints because they just haven't been collecting the information they need to, to do that. Mm -hmm. But other other um, forms of um, you know forensic analysis do 
do provide error rates. And so, for example, forensic anthropologists have been working quite hard on trying to estimate error rates for things like assessing race from skeletons or gender or sex, things like that. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, I do. I think authority does. It's surprising how much that that plays in. Yeah. Yeah. I have, a, I have kind of more conceptual question, yeah. um, and that has to do with your own kind of analytical language. Right. And um, so at the midway through the talk, um, after the pattern recognition and the, um, what I found very compelling discussion of the sort of proposition as being a combination of indexical and iconic semiosis, um, as you were wrapping that up, I sort of said that the evidence can mobilize a certain kind of agency and ability you know, to make a claim, to act. Um, and thus to have certain kinds of effects mm -hmm. as evidence, especially in the kind of courtroom context, um, in the forensic context. Um, and that, that grants the corpse or the material a kind of animacy. And then by the end of the talk, that animacy became a kind of life. And so I guess I'd just like to hear you talk through yeah. more that the chain of reasoning with those terms. Are they all equivalent? Right. Um, agency, action, effects, animacy, life. Yeah. Um, and this, in a way, this ties into Seb's question about authority. I mean, in, in my sense, in my, my thinking, the difference between that life is self animating, mm -hmm. um, even if things can be made animate through outside authority or intentionality. In this case, you know, scientists speaking with the corpse or through the corpse, and not that the corpse sort of speaks for itself. And so, I guess it's a it's a question about where the locus of animation yeah. is vis a vis these kinds of acts of yeah. semiosis. So I think what I'm trying to do is explore a notion of uh, life as semiotic process. So that's coming from Peirce. And this is the idea that you know that you can even you can theorize even the the sort of operations of the cell um, through semiosis through thinking about the way in which uh, particular kind of semiotic habits emerge. Right. That, so entities, living entities, perceive in a <laughs> to use that in a very broad sense. Right. Other things and then act in response to that. And that that's not a, it's not a mechanistic kind of action. It's an it's an action that can grow and it can change and it has it takes on habits. It can, has a certain kind of predictability but it can also shift and can be altered. And so that that's kind of what what's interesting about that is that when when um, living entities do take on these sort of semiotic habits, they bring in and they incorporate elements of the world that we might call non-animate. And that's the way in which so that's the way in which things that we might not think of as animate have animacy or have life or they get enrolled into um, life processes so that's kind of what I was trying to get at, at the end when I'm saying that the, the life of fingerprints is a different kind of life from the life of um, humans or insects and that we have to we have to find ways to acknowledge that and to think through that um, but I did also want to I wanted to, to nod towards all the stuff on material agency and the way in which people have spoken about how material objects seem to have agency in the way that they can sort of insert themselves into human lives and sort of force shifts in perspective or in what's said about them. Um, but my, what I'm arguing there is actually what's happening when when we see that when we talk about that as a type of animacy is what we're really doing is kind of prescinding the sort of iconic index this kind of propositional. Um, sign from its inter interpreting judgment, right? That actually, when a, when an object does seem to intervene in that way, it, it only intervenes because we're we're making a perceptual judgment that it that it's intervening, right? So whether it's a you know whether it's going over a sleeping policeman to use one of Latour's examples and and feeling that the bump and feeling you know slowed down by it, that's a perceptual judgment, right? So that it's a relationship there. So I get, that's what I'm trying to get at is that it's always part of a relationship and that, that, that judgment then that is made or the feeling of being jolted then has additional effects and sort of continues and that's where the life, that's where life inheres is in that, that, those, those, that sort of chain of, of relationships and the way they, it unfolds. Yeah. Does that answer? Yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed the, your presentation. Um, I 
give the expert witness testimony all the oh, really? time. Oh, yeah, wow. uh, only related to art cases. So if there's a question about um, provenance or authenticity, that kind of thing. And one thing that's been interesting within the community of forensic experts in the art world is there was a um, person, Peter Paul Bureau, a few years ago, and I don't know if you've heard about this case, who actually planted a fingerprint in oh, Jackson Hall's studio. I need to find out about this. <laughs> <It's great. laughs> yes. So as a result, <laughs> fingerprint evidence is never admissible in oh, authenticity cases. And so I'm constantly having to deal with art lawyers and clients who are saying, we have a perfect fingerprint that we can use on this object, and we can never use it. It's as if the entire community has decided that fingerprints are suddenly useless. And in fact, we know that they're not, but that they can be planted. And so it's a matter of deep frustration for me that sometimes you really do have a perfect fingerprint on an object of art, and yet we're not allowed to even address the elephant in the room, so to speak. And so it's an interesting example of a community sort of turning its back on one aspect of the evidence. Yeah, and that's where the, the ability to sort of separate out the icon and index is really helpful, right? Because you can say that as a you know that it, as an indexical sign it fails, but as an iconic sign it, it, it you know it, it works, right? So that's so once you once you sort of see how these different axes are operating, it kind of allows you to to make a judgment perhaps on other cases where fingerprints may or may not be yeah visible. I'd love to yeah I'd love to get the reference from you for that. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was kind of trying to hear your lecture as to the prism of, um, of science in general. So I would be interested in how you would see, would you think that this is a case study for um, a call for to do better science, more accurate, without any chance of any fallacy? Or um, alternatively, maybe this is just a case study for questioning science as, as a point of view. Hmm. I think it's about, it's about thinking about science itself as a, a set of, of sort of semiotic habits, right? That we, 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 we fall into established ways of working because they seem to work and they give us the results we want and we need. And, and it's about thinking about what happens, what happens to disrupt those habits? How do those, and how do we, how do we open ourselves to their disruption as well? So um, rather than doubling down when something disrupts them, which is kind of what happened with the fingerprint um, people. When people, when this criticism started to come through, they were just sort of refused to admit that, that they, there could be anything wrong with the practice. So I think it's part of, part of it is kind of opening in, in getting away from this this divide of the object and subject, where you know the, the expert has to fear being polluted by subjectivity, and it has to you know that, that, that you have to keep this sort of rigid fact value separation. Once you sort of open up to thinking about habits more broadly constituted as something that sort of emerge in response to particular conditions and take on a particular life of their own, then you can also sort of open yourself up to thinking about um, possibilities for error possibilities for correction um yeah but you know humans are complicated and we we like to you know i'm the same as anyone else you know once you've deci you decided an idea is something you want to work with it's very hard to um disentangle yourself from it so i, I maybe this is um overly hopeful but yeah, yeah. um i'm wondering how um i'm also really interested in your idea of with the propositional sign um i'm wondering how that comes in in sort of like increasingly abstract representations of the human body and sort of legal and medical discourse, for example, the DNA sample mm -hmm. as like, you know, as like the as, is indexical, but but is it iconic or where is the iconic or does more work need to be done to establish that iconicity? Yeah, I think I, mean, I think you could definitely use some of this to think about um, DNA and the way the, the particularly the way in which DNA is sort of relied upon in ways. Um, as I said, it, it's sort of taking on the, the mantle of the new gold standard in some ways. You know, it's becoming what fingerprint evidence used to be. Um, so I think there's probably there's probably insights to be had in thinking about DNA work that I haven't um, started to think about that too much at the moment. Yeah. Thank you. Okay.
Well, thank you so much for your great questions, and thank you, Zoe, for this wonderful presentation. It gives us a lot to think about. Um, and, and I invite you all to uh, go out into the lobby and 